speaker today is the team, Tim Shepherd, and he's going to talk about the Royal National, the Royal National Lifeboat Institu uh, Institution. He lives in uh, Billerigi, um, linked to the Fathim boat house where he operates from, and he works across eastern region area from South End to the Wasp in Norfolk and right across to Milton Keynes. It's all about fundraising, what they do, and believe it or not, the cost to run this every, well this year anyway, is £160 million. So I think it's been a very interesting talk. Thank you very much indeed for allowing us to come and talk today to, to you. Um, as you can see, uh, and thank you Ray for introducing me, uh, my name's Tim Shepherd. I come from the Raise Awareness team for the Eastern Region. Um, our job is quite a simple one, is to try and help uh, everybody in the eastern region understand what the RNI get up to nowadays and where their vast contributions go to. Um, because I'm working, so, so apologies for that. Um, <coughs> the first thing you need to know about the RNI, it was founded in 1824 by a very interesting guy called Sir William Hillary. Uh, this guy, uh, he uh, formed his own army actually for King George III uh, of 1,400 men and then promptly ran out of money and with creditors uh, ran off to uh, Douglas on the island of uh, Anne where he uh, joined the very first or one of the very few uh, lifeboat life saving uh, crews which was pre RNLI. In uh, 1824 he, through his contacts in London, he went after uh, getting the RNLI, uh, forming a charity, a proper charity for life saving at sea. And they, uh, they formed a charity called the National Institution for the Preservation of Life and Property from Sea Rex, a nice catchy name. But it would be another 30 years in 1854, in 1854 they actually changed the name to the RNLI. And just as a matter of interest, in 1854, that was the first time they actually issued uh, life, guard, life vests to the crews. So for 30 years they were rowing out to sea with absolutely nothing other than just their brawn. Uh, nowadays the charity operates 235 lifeboat stations and 150 lifeguard <coughs> units. But we do a lot more than that and I'm about to show you what we do. Uh, we celebrate the past through for a number of uh, museums. I'll point out uh, the Henry Blog Museum in Cromer. Uh, that's the nearest museum to us here. Um, I've been up to see it. If you ever get a chance to go, it's a really good museum. Um, there's also a really good fish and chip shop, which we've just experienced uh, through your lunch, just around the corner. So I highly recommend that as well. Uh, you'll also see the Grace Darling Museum. Uh, of course, Grace Darling and the Rescue in 1838. Uh, actually um, brought to the forefront uh, life saving at sea. Well that's enough about the history. Um, today we continue to be an independent charity. We are not funded by the government at all. We get less than 1% of our income from the government and most of that if not more goes back in a thing called irrecoverable VAT. <laughs> so they still take it from us even though uh, we're a, a charity. Um, this is uh, a very popular issue that we've got right now. Uh, if you watch the TV, every time the, the TV comes on with a news thing about the Coast Guard, as you know the government's about to change the regulations of the Coast Guard and reduce the number of Coast Guard stations, uh, what they do is they show a picture of an RNLI lifeboat. We are not part of the Coast Guards, we are a totally separate organisation. All the Coast Guards do is through their, through their centres they coordinate all rescue at sea, that's the helicopters and the lifeboats. If you get a problem at sea and you do a mayday or even on shore and you do a 999 ask to the Coast Guard, they will contact the RNLI operation officer office to actually get authorization to launch a lifeboat. Uh, what we do then is we actually send out a bleeper message, message to all our to the crew in, in question for our own uh, communication route uh, and that then summons the crew to the lifeboat. Station. So it is totally independent from uh, the Coast Guard. So if you see anybody talking about the Arnold part of the Coast Guard, please correct them. Um, we are totally reliant upon volunteers, of which I'm one, 
Um, we have over 4,800 4, crew members, 2,000 shore helpers, that's people who actually help launch the boat, maintain the boats, um, and we have 800 lifeguards, uh, most of them are young children, young, young children, they're young people, because I don't know about you, but I can't swim out to sea like they can nowadays, um, who are paid for by the council, but they're actually trained and operated, all their kit comes from the RNLI. Uh, we also have over 35,000 fundraisers in the, in the, in the organisation, and there's only 1,300 fully paid staff in the RNLI. So it's all volunteers. So I don't know where any of you run a big corporation, but if you've got 30, 35,000 people doing your fundraising that can basically not turn up if they don't want to, that's an equally uh, challenging point. Um, Fewer than 10% of our crew are now professional mariners. In days gone past, they were all uh, taken from fishermen or local fishing, uh, local uh, people on boats. Nowadays, it all comes from people who just actually live around the lifeboat station. So if you're under the age of 40 and you want to be on a lifeboat and you're close to South End or Sheerness or even Bernard Krauss, then you can join up and we will train you in every single aspect of life saving at sea. Um, our crews, as you will well guess, are on, um, on standby for 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 360 days a year. Interestingly enough, there was a great story about a, a, a lifeboatman who, got reared, uh, who was just newly trained. He was so eager to get to the lifeboat station that when he turned up, the crew absolutely collapsed in laughter. He'd arrived in his boxer shorts. He hadn't even bothered to get dressed. <laughs> so uh, these guys are very, very enthusiastic to get out there. Um, in 2009, and I apologise, I don't have the 2010 figures yet. They're not available to me for at least another week and a half. Um, they launched over 9,000 times, the boats, and they rescued over 8,000 people. And when we talk about rescuing people, these are people whose lives are physically at risk. Mm -hmm. So they, they, And in their time, since 1824, they saved over 140,000 people from the sea. Our lifeguards dealt with over 13,000 incidents and assisted 16,000 people. Now, I'm about to show you a video of a lifeguarding incident. Um, because what it does is it shows you that the RLI aren't there just for people out on pleasure cruises or, or the cruise of uh, fishing boats. It actually affects your children or your children's children or grandchildren who are on beaches. And you can lose your life on a beach just as quickly as you lose it. So, so let's hopefully this will run. Paddenborth Beach in Cornwall on a bitterly cold February day. It is all but deserted. But on an August day last summer, 15,000 holiday makers were on this beach. It was a perfect hot summer's day and everyone was making for the warm waters. But suddenly, without warning, hugely powerful rip currents started sweeping people off their feet and out to sea. As we were driving across we could just see arms and legs and boogie boards flying everywhere and it was just absolute chaos chaos in the water really, it was just pandemonium and there was women and children, there was grown men just floating off into the middle of the Atlantic. In seconds there was mayhem only yards from the shore. Fun had turned to fear. Could you come back to the area because we've got a massive load of people getting so terribly on the area. Within seconds, the inshore rescue boat was powering to its first casualty. There were so many people, there were so many people in trouble that we just <laughs> grabbed anybody and um, just hooked them into the boat. If we didn't do something quickly, then people were going to drown. So uh, Sophie and I, you know, she picked up people, put them in, I put them in, and um, we then turned the boat around, headed for shore, dumped them off then sped back out again and tried to uh, uh, pick up more people. It all happened in 10 short minutes. 30 people had been plucked from the sea. No one drowned, no one was injured. But it would have been a very different story if the RNLI's lifeguards had not been there on that August day. Okay, on average we rescue four children 
a day. During the month of um, August, when the summer holidays are there, we rescue 18 a day. Um, you are 500 times more safe on a beach with one of the RNLI lifeguards on than you are without one. So if you do take grandchildren or your children, your children take their children to the beach, uh, think about that. Only about 6% of our rescues now are for full-time mariners. The rest are for people out on uh, surfing boards or uh, you know, their own cruisers or their yachts or whatever it is. All of it, most of our instance for that. The fishermen don't normally like their boats to be out of condition, so they maintain them far better than other people. Uh, we also have a flood rescue team um, where we are active in, we're active in Cumbria. We've been overseas to China as well with helping some of the floods over there and they are on standby all the time to get to the flood rescue team. Um, now, Ron when he called me up, and thank you Ron for calling, uh, for allowing us to talk today, um, said to me that we'd like to also know a little bit more about the Thames boat. So this is a new section on the Thames boat. Um, we have four TENS boats uh, in action. Um, the Tower Lifeboat Station, which is actually not based at Tower, it's actually based further on down the river now by the embankment, which I'm sure you've seen, uh, is one of the busiest lifeboat stations that we have. Uh, the boats they use, which I'll come on, I'll show you a video in a minute about it, there are three crew to each boat. Two of those crew are full time members of staff of the RNLI. They have to be because there is so much activity on the river. Um, let me just show you the, uh, oh, oh no, hold on a second. Hey, any good presentation it always goes wrong, isn't it? And the, down. the total for the, boat, for the number of attempts uh, rescues was they launched over 700 times uh, in, in 2009 and rescued over 260 people. On New Year's <coughs> Eve alone, this year, the tower boat rescued four people from the, from the Thames who were so drunk that they fell in. <laughs> okay, so we were on call four times. All right, what I'm going to do now is to actually let a, tem uh, let a film actually show you what the Thames, the Thames boats do. You all right? The Thames is now served by four RNLI stations. London is a city of, I suppose, upwards of 8 million people. Figures of 100,000 people every day use the Thames. In all of the UK and Ireland, uh, the station at Tower and the station at Chiswick are the first and second busiest. Uh, between the two stations cover the 25 miles of the River Thames that travels through London. RNLI crews aim to get to 95% of reported casualties within 15 minutes of the emergency call. Here on the town, the boats that we use are specifically designed to work in this environment. They work in very close quarter situations where things happen very quickly. Because of that, the boats that we use here are entirely open. They're powered by twin water jets, which give them fantastic maneuverability and control in very confined spaces.
the talent is very different to close to work. Um, our jobs are a lot quicker. We have a 90 second response time. So from when the bell goes, we have to be kitted up and off um, within 90 seconds. That's including night shift as well. I've got to go. Can you take that off? Okay, so there's the tent boats for you. Mm -hmm. It gives you a bit of a view of what they do. That was all filmed in one uh, three month period. So pretty pretty impressive stuff. Uh, they talked about the class of boat there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually the E class they use on the Thames. Uh, the Trent is at Sheerness for you. Uh, mm -hmm. The Atlantic 85 and Atlantic 75 is at South End, along with a, heli a, a hovercraft which goes out onto the flats. So these boats are all in very close proximity of where you are now. Um, there's also an E-class at Burnham on Crouch down the estuary as well. As well. Um, I would point out that the new Tamar is £2.7 million pounds, and we need to replace the Tynes who are very old boats. Okay, we also build 60% of our own inshore uh, ribs uh, at our facility in Cowes on the Isle of Wight. Uh, we then sell some of these boats off to other rescue services. Iceland take a lot, the uh, Dutch take a few. Uh, and we're actually in talks at the moment with, um, I think it's um, China, in terms of they wanted to do some stuff for some of their rivers as well. So we're in talks with them as well. <laughs> um, we have a purpose-based training facility in Paul. Uh, this didn't come from donations, this was 10 benefactors built this for us. Uh, it has an indoor swimming pool uh, where we, uh, you actually can stay here if you ever wanted to in Paul. If you can't get a hotel and you're down there, you can stay at the, at, uh, the college. Uh, but uh, it has an indoor swimming pool that's capable of doing thunder, lightning, uh, heavy seas, um, the works. Um, we can make it night, we can make it day, we've got simulators for the boats. Here our crews learn firefighting, first aid, how to write a lifeboat, etc. Um, it is now totally self-sufficient in funding. Uh, the reason for it is, is that film crews want to use the uh, pool so much to, build, to actually do film shots of water that they're forever trying to get into, the, into our facilities to use. Uh, so it's completely self-funded. If you want to become a lifeboatman, you have to, um, if you want to do it for South End, for instance, you have to give one weekend in four on duty. Uh, you have to give at least uh, five weekends uh, a year down in port for training. Um, and you have to be on call 24 hours a day most of the time around the boathouse. So it's a hell of a commitment, and they're mostly volunteers. Uh, since 1996, we went proactive. Uh, one of the problems with the RNLI at the moment is everybody thinks we're a very rich charity. Uh, before 1996, they had significant funds uh, available to them, um, so much so that they just went proactive. We now encourage much younger members to the, to the team as much as we can. Um, and uh, I'll show you some of the proactive stuff we do now. Uh, we provide vital sea information to people. If you have a boat, you can have your boat checked for free on the safety. We also have safety guides on to what you should have on your boat. Um, right up to the signage by slippage, we do all of that. Um, and this little gadget, I don't know you can all see this down the bottom right hand corner. This is called the MOD Guardian. This is brand new. Uh, you buy this for 400 quid and then pay a subscription. It, uh, they know, you put it on board, on board your boat, it knows when you leave harbour. It tells us that you've left harbour. Uh, you can see the land you know, your things, you wear those around <coughs> your neck. If you are separated from your boat, in other words, you fall overboard, the RNLI immediately launch. We know that you are falling into the sea. This is saving lives right now. What do you call it? Uh, MOD Guardian. Okay, we also, our educational team in, uh, uh, in 2009 taught over 316,000 school children beach safety. Uh, now, if you're on a beach, uh, do you know what a black and white flag means? No. Anybody know? Okay. No, it's very close. It's, uh, it's where fast moving objects are, so like surfers or uh, uh, you've got jet skis, stuff like that, so you don't go and swim there. Those are the type of thing we teach these kids. Uh, the other thing we teach them is if you got it, if, well, if your friend gets into trouble, don't follow. Uh, always call for help. And if a 
blow up crocodile, which I'm sure you've seen all the kids that blow up crocodiles, floats you off into the Atlantic then stay with it and wave, wave your hands around because it actually is going to save your life. Um, but we actually teach uh, children this. We also have a young person's web page um, called Stormforce. On here they've got competitions, they've got uh, knowledge on sea safety, uh, and uh, we also have a big thing called Storming, which you might have seen right at the beginning for the children. And we are actively now in, uh, bringing in some stuff which will, which will hit teenagers as well. Okay. Um, the 2011 RNI organisation now looks like this. Uh, it's the life, lifeboats, obviously, the lifeguards, the sea and, sea and beach safety, the rescue team, flood rescue team, our own training, and then of course the volunteers. Uh, 35,000 35, volunteers out trying to raise £160 million. So it's uh, a pretty tall order. Um, Every, every penny you give the RNI, like, we guarantee you that we'll put 84 pence of it directly to saving lives. There are a number of charities, I'm not going to name them, but a number of charities where if you give a pound, 50, only 50 pence finds its way. The RNI like, are incredibly uh, proud of the fact that 84 pence of its uh, money goes straight to the thing, which is why you don't see an advert on TV for the RNI. Like. But we do get letters from you. Oh, you get hundreds of letters. <laughs> uh, I personally are complaining at the moment bitterly into the RLI Eastern region. I now have eight Christmas catalogues for the shop. So uh, I actually say, like any organisation, we sure know how to waste money as well sometimes, so we get it wrong. But we are a massive organisation, and I'm sure you'll forgive us occasionally. Um, our life saving equipment, you can see, uh, to put a life jacket on this guy costs £385. Um, to train a life uh, uh, a lifeboatman costs a thousand pounds a year. So you times that by four four thousand eight hundred, and you'll know what that costs are. Um, it is a very expensive situation to keep the life you know, the life situation. So without your support, we can't continue. Now I am crap at asking people for money, and I'm sure lots of charities come here do a presentation, ask you for lots of money. It's entirely up to you whether you support the RNI or not. Well, what I'd like to do now, if you wouldn't mind, is to run a promotional video. One, because it just gives you it uh, gives you a better idea. It also sums up everything I've just said. So hopefully, this will run as well. The sea. It's where the RNLI do what we've always done. Save lives. Let's see. We've been launching lifeboats to save lives at sea since 1824. Once, lifeboat crews rode out into heavy seas with nothing but brawn and oars, sails, and courage. Modern lifeboats may have changed, but some things never do, like the ferocity of the sea and the timeless courage of our crews. Our volunteers take on the sea day after day, night after night, year in, year out. The sea has no days off, so nor do we. The RNLI is there, ready to go to the rescue whenever and wherever there's a need. Today, more than 230 lifeboat stations surround our shores, provide a ring of safety and constant readiness around the coasts of Britain and Ireland, up to 100 nautical miles offshore. In days gone by, lifeboats drew their crews from the local fishing community. Times change. Today, only one in ten volunteers have a professional maritime occupation. Yet the job has never been more technical or more demanding. Thus, the training of every one of our volunteers who go to sea has never been more important. Because it's that training, matched to our crew's courage, that saves lives. Time after time after time. Please help the RNLI in any way you can. By donating, by becoming a member, or by getting involved in fundraising activities. Help our ordinary people do extraordinary things. Train one. Save many.
but so it gives you a pretty good insight. Has anybody got any questions or further questions? Yeah, good. You mentioned about the uh, cuts in the Coast Guard service. Yeah. What is the impact on the RNLI of it's, that? It's going to be, we don't know yet, but it's going to be quite big. Mm -hmm. They're talking about closing eight out of 18 stations. Uh, and therefore, where the Coast Guard is getting regional stuff and those to launch lifeboats, we've got to re rejig all our operations to take it from just eight. So it's going to have a big impact. And has the government given any money to take no. on this extra? No, I'm not so. Yeah, no. Yeah, just a few quick things, but um, I gather it's probably a decision on the part of the RNLI not to seek government support because you've always wanted to maintain your independence and not be regulated. That's fine, isn't yes. it? Yeah. Um, the other thing is the, the hovercrafts, did they come in in time to help at Morecambe Bay with the shrimpers? Yes, I mean, there are, there are only seven, I think it's seven hovercrafts, but they're normally placed where there are estuaries like that. Um, I mean, I can find out for you, but um, I'm not. I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. And do you get help from the Metropolitan Police soldiers with the Thames rescues? Yes, actually, every time if you don't jump in the Thames and we pull you out, the police come straight away and arrest you. All part of the service. As if you're alive, of course. <laughs> I think the most important thing in the back of my mind is that you must be suffering. Uh, because of the culture of holiday homes and the like in finding crews who are now able to afford to live near enough to a lifeboat station because obviously lots of coastal homes are taken up by outsiders. Yeah, we, we, there's no doubt we've got a continuous desire to bring more people on. Um, luckily enough we get a lot of business people, you know, normally the lifeboats are in, in a community where there's shops and stuff like that. We do get quite a lot of business people who are running the shops to actually join join and come onto the lifeboats. We also have a number of sort of 18 and 18 year olds up as 19 and 20 year olds who are quite keen to take part. But you're right, as, uh, as things change in the coastal areas, so we, so we have to adjust to get the lifeguards into so the is there the a time limit for all our distance travelling and so forth? Um, yeah, now I do know the answer to that. We, are, we launch our offshores in 12 minutes, I think it is, um, and we do... So you've got to get a crew member there in 10 minutes then, don't Yeah, you? You, let me just check that for you. Hold on a second. Sorry, sorry of course. Um, I can show that. An inshore boat takes 7 minutes to launch, and an all-weather boat 12 minutes. Um, South End takes 20 minutes because they've actually got to get down the end of the pier. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it does mean that the crew member's got to be within 10 travelling. Yeah, you've got to be able to get to the crew to the, to the lifeboat pretty quickly. It's tough in some cases. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, just one final thing, which is um, for me. Um, I, at Benbridge last year, and I noticed they were building a big slip at Benbridge, which I gathered was to launch, obviously, a faster and more powerful lifeboat. Yeah. I mean, that in itself must be another enormous uh, cost factor, which you haven't mentioned today. No, it, it actually costs us £2 million pounds to put a new slipway in. And, and the, new, the new Tamar boat actually needs the new slip, slipway. It has to be a longer slipway for the boat to go in. But a lot of the boats nowadays are actually moored, ready to go straight out to sea. So they, they don't actually come down the traditional slipway as they used to do. Uh, Cromer, for instance, had to have a completely new boat house when it took its new boat. And they're obviously very good sea boats. Uh, how long do they last? What's their average age? And uh, do you sell them or do you scrap them or what? Uh, they do go on to other. Yes. They do go on to other life-saving uh, people. They do buy yes, them. Uh, we do take the older ones down to our training facility. Some do get scrapped. We take the equipment off. I mean, a lot of the equipment on board these boats is reusable, as you can imagine. So we take it all off. Um, the the, the boat that, um, you have to forgive me, I've only, I'm getting used to all the names of the boats and everything, but one of the very first boats you saw in the uh, presentation, let me just get the information for you. Um, okay. um, the time um, was introduced in 1982. And it was the year after the Solomon Brown um, loss of the wooden boats um, uh, down in Cornwall. So it's um, actually 
that's the first metal boat that was ever put into the RLI, self writing metal boat at the time. But as you can see, it was put on, put on station in 1982. There are very few of those. They're being replaced now by the Tamar. So as I say, we're having to rebuild for the lifeboat. Did you see the picture of the lifeboat station with the lift coming down and the, mm -hmm. and the boat launching? That's actually Padstow. That's a brand new station that has its own funicular railway to get to the boat station. Are they British built? Sorry? Are they British built? Yes, they are. <coughs> well, sorry. <laughs> yeah. and obviously, some of your volunteers hold down everyday jobs. Yes. So you rely a lot, a lot on the goodwill of their employers. Yes, and we do. And you don't have any problems? We don't have any problems. Most people, most employees will, will happily in the coastal areas allow us to have people on the boats. As you can see in the Thames Basin again, we've got full-time staff. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a reason why the, the boats haven't got a, a winch on them so that when they pick somebody up they can't just put the winch out and then just drop a, a line to pull them out um, the on, the, on the bigger boats, your weather boats, they do actually have the, some of the, they have the winches on them to yeah. actually pull it's people out. Get people out, it's not where you think. Um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, because we're using fast active ribs to get to the people, they, but there's the weight issue as well on board the boat. As you can see, there was a lot of rescue from one big set of people. That boat would not be able to carry those people if we didn't have a lightweight boat. Um, it's mostly the Thames that they're pulling people out of. Yeah. We'll have to, uh, get yeah, sorry. Back. We'll have to get you to come back, Tim, and speak some more, because it's a very interesting uh, topic, <coughs> topic what we're um, <coughs> discussing. Um, I'd like to call upon uh, Alan Thomas now, please, to give a vote. Thanks. 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 It is a nice bit, isn't it? <laughs> Mr. President, fellow Italian guests, Tim, that was a wonderful uh, show you gave us there. Yeah, it was yeah. a brilliant talk, yeah. brilliant videos, and uh, skills, etc. I couldn't do it better, but it did myself. Can I go? So you do fantastic work. It's something that's always been close to my heart, and it's all I can say is. I wish you every, every success in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, yeah. in your way. Thank you, Jim. Okay, thank you. Thank you.